Hello, Internet watchers and listeners, and welcome to this Northern Lights Books author interview plunge. Today's guest is magic realism author Lily Iona McKenzie. Lily, originally from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, is currently based in the San Francisco Bay Area and has three books to her credit, 2015's Fling, 2017's Curva Peligrosa, and a poetry collection, All This, in 2011. Her next book, Freefall, A Divine Comedy, is due out in 2018. Lily has led a fascinating life that includes being a high school dropout, a mother at 17, working as a stock girl, long distance operator, secretary, cocktail waitress, and being the first woman to work on the San Francisco docks where she almost got her legs broken. She's founded and managed homeless shelters, co-created weekly radio programs for children, and in her copious spare time, earned master's degrees in creative writing and humanities, and she's taught rhetoric and creative writing at the University of San Francisco. Her reviews, interviews, short fiction, poetry, travel pieces, essays, and memoir have appeared in over 155 American and Canadian venues. In Between Breaths, she blogs at lilyionamckenzie.wordpress.com. You can find links to Lily's books, her web presences, and some examples of her work on this interview page. Ladies and gentlemen, lurkers and trolls, and any other internet denizens listening and watching, please welcome Lily Iona McKenzie. Hello. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Great introduction. Thank you. Glad to have you here today. Thank you for taking the time. Obviously, you're a very busy person. So, I am. Yeah. Well, you are. No question about it. Which is right to the first question. You've had a fascinating life and you ended up being published. So tell us, how did this all come about? Yeah, it's a good question because I certainly, uh, you know, as a young woman, had no idea that I was, in quote, a writer, and that I, if anyone had told me then that uh, in uh, 2018, you will have published three books and you will have more, uh, you know, on the way. Uh, so I, I guess, when I was 13, I kept a diary, but it was a coded diary, and I, I have no idea what the code was that I came up with, but I wanted to make sure that anyone who found my diary would not be able to read it. <laughs> so uh, that diary, you know, who knows where it ended up, but as I think about it, it seems that that was my first impulse to try and express something on the page that was inside me and that was important for me to get out. So, um, yeah, so that, that, it seems to me that was my first attempt to uh, project myself into the world as a writer. But it wasn't really until I was in my mid-20s that I, um, uh, I, I was working as a sales representative for a company called Olston Temporary Services. And I, um, was riding to work one day with a colleague and we were talking about my past and you know having left home at 15 and being a high school dropout and all these things and she was saying you know what an interesting uh life you've had already and i don't know where these words came from but i recall so vividly saying to her i want to be a writer someday <laughs> and Again, you know, where, where did this come from? And I just sort of looked around and thought, okay, I want to be a writer someday. <laughs> At that point, I had not been to college uh, and had no idea what being a writer meant. I didn't know if you'd asked me then what creative writing was, I couldn't have told you. So it sort of, uh, it's sort of been uh, uh, miraculous that I did end up discovering my writer self, and it actually came about because of a deep depression I went into not long after I made that statement that mm -hmm. I would be a writer someday. Mm -hmm. and so during that year of deep depression, I started uh, keeping journals. And uh, I also, of course, worked with a therapist and, and in the process managed to uh, uncover the buried writer. Hmm. Uh, but also the journal keeping then became a part of my life forever. And uh, ever since then, every day I write 
always write down my dreams and uh, think about them. And they have formed a real foundation, I think, for uh, my writing self because they have such a rich uh, access to the unconscious, to imagination, etc. cetera. Um, so, yes, that's, that's sort of how I got here. Mm -hmm. Part of that's it. <laughs> well, it, thank God it was well, part of it in the sense that then there's the process of preparing uh -huh. myself, you know, getting educated, finding right. out what creative writing means. Well, I'm, I'm glad it was such a straight line. Yes, right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, it seems that a lot of your life can be summed up as once you know what you want, go for it. You've, you've had all these things happen in your life. You, you s decided at an early stage, obviously, you wanted to be a writer, and you just kept on, on that path. And, and no matter where it took you, you were gathering experiences that you eventually would put into your books. Yes. Is that, is that sense of once you know what you want, go for it, is that something you share with your characters in your stories? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, and uh, uh, I can't think of a character at the moment uh, that I've created that wouldn't go for it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I'm sure I must, I mean, for example, Curva Pellegrosa, uh, the main character in that novel, uh, she's from Mexico originally, and she starts out on what's called the Old North Trail from Southern Mexico and uh, eventually ends up in Canada. Uh, so she certainly went for it and didn't uh, turn back. So uh, yes, I, I would say that's a characteristic, not just of me, but also of my characters. Okay, um, you also have taught rhetoric, you teach, uh, you, you have taught creative writing, I'm not sure if you still teach it. I do. Okay, is that something, is that philosophy something you put into your teaching as well? Well, you know, I think that in order to be successful as a writer, you have to be absolutely determined uh, because there are so many obstacles that you can run in along the way, including your own self-doubt. So if you, if you don't have that determination, if you can't persist, then you're not going to get very far as a writer, I don't think you can succeed. Uh, so uh, in terms of the teaching, of course, I would share those experiences with my students as well. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, to your question. Very good. Your biography states, magical realism pulses at the heart of my narratives. And I think that's a beautiful sentiment. For, for everyone listening and watching who may not be as educated as I, what is magic realism? Because I'm not really sure that I know. Do I have to be from South America and speak Brazilian Portuguese to, to understand it? Uh, I, I've read Borges and Marquis and Allende and I can actually almost sound intelligent, but what, what exactly is magic realism? Well, you know, certainly uh, uh, the Latin American writers uh, seem to have uh, been at the forefront of um, that genre, but it started before them. I mean, Ovid's Metamorphoses, you know, for example, I'm sure we can come up with many more from ancient times. So it isn't as if it's something new in our world. And I think anyone who has uh, an expansive sense of the world around him or her uh, would have to say that there are magical elements in the world constantly. And, and I'll give an example from my childhood because I think in childhood we're more cl closely connected to what the magical aspect of the world is. I can remember when I was four years old, I had uh, my grandfather was a Scottish schoolmaster and he was very anchored in realism and did not want his granddaughter to, uh, uh, you know, get lost in the fantasy world. So uh, he told me that there was no Santa Claus. He told me there was no Jack Frost. And of course, I, I knew absolutely, uh, I, I knew that he was wrong mm -hmm. because I could hear on Christmas Eve, every Christmas Eve, I could hear Santa Claus with his reindeers on our roof 
I could hear him come down the chimney. I could hear him ho, ho, ho in the living room. <laughs> I mean, he was real to me. Mm -hmm. And so was Jack Frost. I mean, when I looked at these incredible markings on our windows in the wintertime, what? Who else could do this but Jack Frost? So for me, magical realism, uh, I think, comes out of, uh, uh, more out of the surrealistic movement uh, in the sense that uh, surrealism was much more open to exploring what came from the unconscious. And I think those of us who write magical realism uh, have a similar tendency. It isn't that the real world isn't important. It is. It's extraordinarily important. That's where I live. I love it. But it's being open to allowing in some of these other elements. And if you have a sense, as I do, of uh, something beyond this earth, uh, who knows what it is, but I, you know, I, I like what the physicists uh, have discovered about these different, you know, their string theory and per perhaps parallel universes, then it, it, uh, I feel as if uh, in our writing, we need to be able to uh, allow for those kinds of possibilities. So that's kind of a long way maybe of saying my perspective on magical realism uh, is not an official <laughs> definition, but it's Lily's. Well, thank you. I think that was very informative. I, I happen to love metamorphosis. I, I read passages to my wife. Yeah, she it's goes, wonderful. I don't understand Greek, she says to me. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> you to her, do you read it to her in Greek? <laughs> I uh, Only if I want her to look at me strangely. <laughs> okay, magic realism. Let's stay with this for a second. I, I, I understand, I believe that Curva Pellegrosa deals with the magical realism. Is that correct? He does deal with it. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us then about Curva Pellegrosa? Because you know there are people out there saying, what kind of speedball is that in baseball? The Curva Pellegrosa? No. Curva Pellegrosa. Yeah, Curva Pellegrosa means dangerous curve if you don't speak Spanish. And... Um, are you interested in hearing how I came to write the book or how Curva came to, into existence? Or I'm interested in what you want she, people yeah. to know about the book. Well, well I, I, I think I'll start uh, from the beginning because uh, here is an example of a writer needing to be persistent and determined uh, because it was, I keep a writer's notebook as I, uh, in addition to my own daily journals. And uh, when I was looking back at my notes for Curva Pellegrosa, I discovered that in 2005, I had read in the newspaper that there was a tornado that had hit this small town outside of Calgary, a city where I grew up in Canada. And for some reason, that image absolutely gripped me. I, uh, the, the image of uh, you know, this natural force coming to a place and turning everything upside down uh, and the lives then, how they would be changed by that. Uh, so I had wrote in my journal at, the, at that time, you know, that this really gripped me and I feel there's a story here and, uh, you know, I, I hope to get to it. So in 2003 then, I started writing the book and of course the novel starts then with, guess what? A tornado that hits this town, fictional town of Weed, Alberta. And uh, the tornado carries with it this purple outhouse, brings it to the center of Weed, and inside the purple outhouse is this main character, Curva Pellegrosa. And we come to learn then that uh, Curva, uh, who uh, originated in southern Mexico, um, had followed this Old North Trail to uh, Canada. And, and there actually is an Old North Trail. Uh, it runs between uh, southern Mexico and the Arctic and between the Continental Divide and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and uh, uh, so this journey took her 20 years on horseback, you know, pulling a travois uh, with her uh, dog and her horses and two parrots and uh, 
a goat. Uh, and in between, so she would only travel on the trail during the when, months when the weather was decent. In between, she would stop in various towns. She was a rodeo rider. She was an expert horsewoman. And, uh, and she also was really excellent with guns. So she earned money then off the trail by sharpshooting and also uh, competing in rodeos, but she couldn't compete in rodeos as a woman. She had to compete as a man, so she would disguise herself as a man and, uh, you know, run off with all this money, and of course all the other rodeo riders hated her. Uh, anyway, so once she gets to Weed, Alberta, uh, she's decided then that it's time for her to settle down, and she finds uh, some property there, She's able to buy it with the money she saved. And uh, she settles down, but she unsettles weed. So her presence uh, really does turn the town upside down, you know, morally, sexually, spiritually, in almost any way you can think of. And, but it, it wasn't a negative thing because she also had this compelling personality. She came across in a really uh, uh, engaging way. She was warm, she was friendly, and, and people came to, uh, she also had, was a midwife. Uh, she had learned those skills on her travels and, and had some medicinal uh, herbs, including marijuana that she grew, <laughs> that she'd uh, grown on her way <laughs> Up to, up to Canada and carried with her. So, you know, people would come and visit her and they'd leave feeling very happy after they'd uh, imbibed some of, some of her dandelion wine that she made and, and her marijuana that they didn't know that's what they were imbibing. Uh, anyway, so she did, uh, uh, things just happened around her. Time stopped, clocks stopped, uh, water would appear. Uh, and disappear. So you never quite knew what was going to happen around Curva, and uh, that carries on throughout the book. Wonderful. Is there, based on what you just shared, based on your life, based on your teachings, is there an overriding message you'd like readers to get from your books? Well, you know, uh, I don't start out writing with a message in mind. I start out because I have questions. And uh, uh, when I wrote uh, Fling, uh, my question was, uh, you know, <laughs> what happens to a mother and daughter after um, they get a message from the dead letter office in Mexico City telling them that uh, the mother's, mother's ashes had turned up after 70 years. What happens to <laughs> a mother and daughter when they get that message? And so it's a quest. And they start off, they go to southern Mexico, and all of these crazy things happen. Again, it's another magical realism uh, type of story. <clears throat> With Curva, it was what happens when uh, a woman from southern Mexico starts out on this trail, uh, who uh, this would have been in the 40s, 50s, and, and uh, how, how does she conduct herself? How does she make her way in the world? It's a quest story, too. Uh, so, uh, uh, so my novels start with those questions, not with a message. I guess the message ends up being uh, uh, <laughs> follow your bliss. I mean, that sounds sort of a little, a little too pat. But uh, these are essentially uh, female, strong female characters. And, uh, and I'm sure that in a certain way, uh, uh, some aspect of my feminist self comes out in these stories. And, uh, um, and I'm, you know, wanting to show these women being able to uh, master certain situations, which they, which they do. 
in terms of Curva Pellagrosa, I think the message that comes out of that book is uh, stop and look at the flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of Curva's ambitions is to recreate this Eden-like existence she'd experienced once. And she tries to do that in Weed, Alberta. And has some frustrations because, of course, progress happens and you can't turn it away. Excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> Sorry. It's okay. Allergies. <coughs> anyway. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it sounds, it isn't as simplistic as that, but I think there, that's certainly an underlying message in Curva right. is, yeah, slow okay. down. <coughs> I will. Excuse me. It's all right. You want to get something to drink? Do you want to? Good. Okay. Uh, you have two different publishers, Pin L, I believe, and Regal House. Pin L, uh-huh. Uh, was that your choice to have two different publishers? Was it your agent's choice? What, what's the reasoning behind the two different publishers? Well, uh, I stopped trying to work through agents after um, I've had three of them. One of them uh, uh, thought when he read Curva that he was going to have a bidding war over it and was really excited about the book Unfortunately, that was in 2009 during the financial downturn and um, he wasn't able to get it published. So <coughs> I decided after that that um, I would send it out on my own. So I decided uh, when uh, my New York agent wasn't able to sell Curva that I would then uh, uh, take responsibility for it myself. And I uh, took it through. I hired a professional editor. I thought, let's see if I can make it better. And, uh, and I did. Uh, and after I went through more revisions then with it, I started sending it out on my own to small presses. And Regal House uh, picked up the book then. But before that, I had published Fling. And I had published Fling with Pinnell Publishing. And again, same thing. I had decided when I wasn't able to sell it through an agent that I would send it out on my own. Pinnell loved it and they published it. And they're the ones that are going to publish Freefall, which is coming out in July. And they gave me a three book contract actually, which includes Freefall and two novels after Freefall that feature the same main character. So why Pinnell and why Regal? Because uh, Pinnell, uh, doesn't have the in-depth editing that Regal House offered. And I knew that Curva Pellegrosa was a more complicated book. Uh, I mean, it, it has uh, a main narrative uh, in third person. It has a first person narrative in letters that Curva writes from the Old North Trail to her dead brother. It has some poems in it. It also has what's called intertextuality, where I bring in, there's another novel written by a fictional uh, Latin American writer, uh, uh, and it is, uh, its location is Burumba, Mexico, invented. Uh, and uh, so I'm, you know, I'm bringing all these elements together in Curva Pellegrosa, so I know, I knew that I needed someone who could give me the kind of extensive feedback that I wasn't going to get from Pinnell. Pinnell does a great job with copy editing and putting out a book and so on, and they're wonderful to work with. But uh, Regal House gave me um, what I needed for Curva. Okay, both Regal House and Pinnell, I believe, would be classified as small publishers, yes. which leaves a, a lot of the marketing up to you. Is that correct? It does. Yeah. How, what's marketing like for you? How do you market? How do I market? How do I not market? <laughs> uh, 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 let me count the ways. Well, um, uh, I think even the big publishers, writers with the big publishers, big presses now have to do a lot of marketing on their own. Uh, and much of it happens through uh, social media, of course. I'm um, a member of about a dozen Facebook groups that uh, uh, have 
a lot of them are, are uh, other writers, but we share ideas. I'm in a um, book of book marketers and we share ideas on how to you know promote, promote our work. We cheer each other on. Uh, so there's that. Uh, blogs are really important. Uh, I've made connections with a lot of different blogs and uh, have done, of course, blog tours uh, promoting my, my novels. And um, Twitter is, you know, all part of this. Uh, and uh, also just making contacts with people in the community, libraries, are an important uh, uh, place to promote your work. Uh, to, and if you can get them to buy your books, that's uh, great too, but it's in your hands uh, to contact them. Uh, I did a recently did a, a panel discussion with two other published writers and uh, at uh, two different libraries in the Bay Area. Uh, and that was, you know, we had a nice turnout at those events. So it was a way to uh, not only help other writers learn more about the path to publication, but also uh, to make them aware of our work too. Uh, and of course, you try to get readings wherever you can. When I published Fling, since it has two older characters, one was 90, the other was uh, 59. I decided to contact senior residences in the Bay Area, and I visited at least 30 of them and did readings, and it was a wonderful place to do readings. They're hungry for that kind of uh, event. Um, so, you know, I've contacted uh, uh, meetups, you know, to try and connect with uh, uh, book clubs. I. I'm constantly looking on the internet for places, you know, book where I can connect with book clubs, book groups. Um, I mean, the internet is essential to this whole uh, world of marketing for writers, uh, clearly. And, um, uh, and just also networking with, with other writers, uh, you know, sometimes arranging events that we can share in and, and just sharing our experiences. So everything, I mean, I, I, I'm constantly thinking about, okay, here I am with you. Here's another uh, uh, example of, um, you know, what I've done to try and promote my work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic. You mentioned in, in that, <laughs> that amazing span of things you are involved with, you mentioned writers groups and conferences do you feel that they are as important as they used to be let's say 15 20 years ago before the internet was all over everything yeah because you did blog tours blog book tours i believe it was yeah i did blog book tours you know i think that uh i don't go to conferences uh any longer and it's it's not that i don't think that writers uh, get a lot from them. I think it depends on what level you're at in your writing. I think if you're uh, starting out as a writer or maybe, you know, sort of midway still finding your way, I think conferences can be a wonderful way not only to get feedback from professional authors uh, that are teaching panels and so on, but also to meet with other writers and get their input as well. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, in terms of getting help um, myself for my writing, I started an online uh, writers group years ago. We were all graduates of the San Francisco State Creative Writing Program, Masters in Creative Writing Program. And I, I can't even, I mean, it's been at least 12 years uh, that we've been meeting uh, online some of them I've never seen in person. And we've been sharing our work. We uh, exchange our work every couple of weeks and um, give each other feedback. I, you know, I think if you can, uh, as a writer, if you can connect with that kind of a group or create one, and there's so many opportunities to do that. I mean, if, you're, uh, if you join the Women's, what is it? Uh, Women's Fiction Writers Association. I, I don't know, it costs maybe $50 a year 
they have lots of groups for uh, for women, for writing groups, and different all kinds of different opportunities uh, for writers to interact and network. They give, uh, I think, yearly they have some kind of a meeting as well. Story Circle Network is another for women. Sorry, guys. I mean, there must be places for guys out there too. But since I'm a woman, that's the they're the ones that I uh, focus on. But Story Circle Network also is another possibility. Uh, the uh, National Women's National. Writers Association, I think it's called, you know, that's, they're known nationally. Again, all of these groups uh, give you opportunities to learn more about marketing, about writing, about what it means to be a writer in today's world. Thank you so much for that. I, I'm just on the verge here of having a sex change so I can join some <laughs> <No>, you can. <laughs> um, your work has appeared in over 155 American and Canadian venues. I'm guessing not all of that is magic realism. So what, what other genres do you write in? And, and what do you read that powers all this? Yeah, I read a lot. And I read, uh, you know, not only uh, uh, visually, but I read uh, audio books uh, because I'm on the go a lot, driving, and even just working around the house, uh, I'll turn on an audio book because I want to hear. I'm learning constantly. This is, you know, you never master, uh, um, you know, being a writer, all of the things that you can learn. So at the moment, for example, I'm, I'm listening to this book, Death by Water, by this Japanese writer, Oe, Oe, I think I said that right. And uh, so I'm always, I'm always looking for uh, techniques. How did, you know, how did they, uh, uh, how did they do whatever it is that they're doing? I'm, I'm analyzing, I'm studying constantly. So, um, um, so am I losing the question back to uh, how do I? What do you read and what yeah. genres do you write in? Well, you know, and so I read a lot of different things. I read lots of fiction, of course. I read lots of poetry, but I'm also interested in biographies. Uh, I'm intensely interested in politics. So, um, you know, I, I read a lot. I'm and and uh, and I've written. I'm I'm not averse to reading to writing realism. Uh, I certainly write a lot in that mode. Uh, in terms of um, essays, reviews, uh, critiques, uh, travel pieces, uh, and uh, memoir. But um, also, I write poetry, and that's poetry is really at the foundation, I think, of my writing. And I even had a dream once where in the dream, I was being told that, that poetry was, you know, the, the kernel for all of my writing mm -hmm. um, and 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 I can when I r write a poem I don't have the same need to publish it as I do when I write fiction uh, it's so satisfying just to write a good poem uh, that uh, you know I don't I don't need to take the other step and publish it but of course I do <laughs> when I can but, but it isn't it isn't an, an, a necessity and I guess as long as I'm saying that, uh, and, as, and to those writers out there who are still feeling their way along or maybe advanced too, uh, publishing isn't uh, the end game necessarily. I think you have to write uh, uh, because you have to write, because it's essential for your well-being and for uh, living a good life. And uh, if you can publish, I think it's tremendous because, of course, we all want readers. Uh, we want our children to uh, grow up. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that uh, you have to publish in order to uh, be a writer. Okay. I'll accept that. Not for myself, though. I, I have to be published. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Um, you write all these different things 
what did you find most useful in learning to write? You've, you've studied at San Francisco University, you taught. What was the most useful thing to learn in the process of writing? Yes, well, you know, the, the workshops that uh, I uh, uh, took at San Francisco State were useful to a certain degree. Uh, what I what I discovered though is that um, you have to you have to de develop a very strong inner editor and be discriminating in uh, the in how you accept the comments that are made on your work because not all the comments are necessarily helpful or going to move you in the direction you need to move in. For example, uh, when I was uh, first trying to write short fiction uh, and I presented something uh, in a San Francisco State creative writing workshop, the teacher herself was um, on the moon. Uh, I was trying to do something different with uh, a kind of a magical realism quality, symbolistic uh, and, you know, sure, I was a beginner and maybe I wasn't uh, hitting it, but she didn't she didn't get it. And so her comments then, uh, she wasn't able uh, to be the ideal reader for someone like myself uh, who is still exploring. And, uh, and she shut me down. Her comments really shut me down. And it took me uh, a while after I had left that program uh, to let myself experiment again and begin to trust then in this voice that was developing in me and, um, uh, you know, taking up a presence on the page. So uh, when you enter these programs, you have to uh, realize that not all of the um, feedback you get will be helpful, and that includes from teachers as well. Uh, so once again, you have to be discriminating. Um, what was the most helpful? Reading, mm -hmm. read, reading, reading, and, uh, and reading about uh, what other writers have to say about their process. I mm -hmm. found that extraordinarily helpful. So I have tons of books in my uh, bookshelf, you know, that are uh, conversations uh, that writers are having with each other or just, you know, commenting on, you know, something to do with their process. So I, I think um, I highly encourage that. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you continued to write. And I hope you do yes. continue to write. Yeah. Yes. But that's the determination part, Joe. I mean, I right. think, yeah. Um, I know I've kept you online for a while. I appreciate your time. I got a couple more questions if I can. Okay. All right. Your current project, I, I, I believe Free Fall, a divine comedy, is already completed. Is that correct? The book is completed, yes. Okay. So but what are you working on right now if it's not Free Fall? What is, what is the next Lily no. Iona Mackenzie that we're going to see? Right. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Pinnell uh, contracted with me for three books, Free, Free Fall being the first in the series. So the other two books also fil feature Tilly, uh, who is uh, the main character in Free Fall. So the next one in the series then follows Tilly to her childhood. And it's entitled Tilly uh, Portraits of a Canadian Girl in Training. <laughs> and uh, and so we uh, we follow Tilly from her beginnings on a farm uh, outside of Calgary until she's about seventeen, and uh, she's has a pretty um, uh, interesting <laughs> I'll say interesting uh, life up until then, and you can see that uh, she's going to have some struggles ahead of her because she's already had to learn how to cope uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's what so I've just I've just done uh, uh, I think I finished almost a, a draft of that 
and I'll be uh, sending that out to get some beta readers feedback on it. And then I, so I've started working on the, then the third in the series, and I don't know what the title will be, but again, it will feature Tilly picking up from uh, her at 17 and following her uh, to how she became an artist. Mm -hmm. Tilly's a wacky installation artist in free fall. And so this will then uh, help the reader uh, discover how Tilly came to be that. Okay, excellent. Looking forward to it. Last question. What question do you wish that someone would ask about you or your books or your poetry, whatever, but nobody has? Huh. <laughs> um. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, 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 type? So do you prefer using uh, Verdana or uh, is it Calibri or, uh, yeah, which, what's your favorite, uh, you know, in, in WordPress when you're- Oh, font, do you mean font? Yeah, font, thank you, thank you. So what's your favorite font, Lily? What is your favorite font, Lily? People want to know. Yeah, right. Well, I struggle with that a lot, Joe. Uh, the, font, <laughs> the font thing is, is really tough, you know, because in, in some instances, I like Verdana because it's just sort of plain and uh, large enough for me to read. <laughs> but then I like uh, uh, Calibri has a little more delicacy to it. So I've been using Calibri a lot lately. Uh, but you know, Times New Roman, you can't get around. Most publishers want you to use that. So I end up using a lot of Times New Roman. Um, but uh, that's my font story. Okay, so let me, I, I, have to, I have to ask if I've got this straight. You, you started pursuing the career of being an author early you traveled around, you left Calgary to San Francisco, you started children's radio shows, workshops, you almost had your legs broken on the docks, and your great concern is the font you have to use. Okay, I, I think I got this, I'm good. All right, just so long as we got that one straight. Um, Lily, Iona, Mackenzie, I want to thank you. This has been a fantastic interview. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, people, thank everyone paying attention, uh, you can find links to Lily's books and her, her web presence, et cetera, et cetera, on this page. And I hope you do follow up. Uh, she's going to have the uh, free fall coming out in 2018. Her poetry, all this was published in 2011. Who's the publisher for all this? Little Red Tree Publishing. Little Red Tree Publishing. You can find that online. Very good. Uh, and there's Fling and, of course, of course, Curva Pellegrosa, the magic realism, dangerous curves, ending up in a windmill in a weed Calgary. Did I get that right? Weed Alberta. <laughs> weed Alberta. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you again so much. Um, any final words? Well, I just, uh, if uh, to all of the writers out there uh, who are uh, struggling, just you have to keep writing and remember that the heart of writing is revising. So revise, 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 read, 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 get good feedback, edit, edit, edit revise some more, read some more, and just keep writing. Keep believing in yourself. Keep believing in yourself. Excellent. Everything you've said is excellent. Keep believing in yourself. Thank you so much again, Lily. I appreciate this. I'm sure everyone paying attention and listening and watching will as well. You have a Thank great day. You. Yes, same. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.